King of the Harem Heaven, Chapter 14 It was the trial of the century. It lasted more than three months, covering 51 actual days of testimony. And on a good share of those 51 days, the stories of Ben Purnell's villainy ran side by side with the stories of Charles Lindbergh's heroism on the front pages of the nation's newspapers. 500 exhibits were introduced. 225 witnesses were called. His once powerful body so wasted by tuberculosis that he weighed a mere 100 pounds. His once striking red gold hair so hopelessly faded to gray that he no longer bothered dyeing it black. King Ben was brought in on a stretcher to lay there and listen in silence while an endless parade of witnesses recounted nearly every sin of his busy lifetime. His 23 years of rule at Ben Harbor, his days at Forstoria, his pushcart and covered wagon travels, his part in the Detroit colony, his wanderings as a street preacher, his life as a hobo. Even Angelina, the wife he hadn't seen in 48 years, managed to testify against him. What was he doing while he was married to you? George Nichols, the special prosecutor spearheading the attack for the Attorney General's office, asked the little old mountain lady. Nothing, she told him, just living off my father. It has been claimed that Benjamin Purnell was an industrious young broom maker in his youth. Was he a broom maker when he was living with you? Nah, he never made no brooms, never while I knowed him. The first day of the trial, May 16, 1927, had been devoted entirely to the prosecution's opening statement. Although three criminal charges of rape, brought by Ruth and Gladys Bamford and Bessie Daniels, were pending against King Ben, the state of Michigan had decided to concentrate its first and primary effort in a suit to have the House of David abolished as a menace to public morals. It was on the second day that Angelina took the stand. In a surprise move, the prosecution also called a number of hostile witnesses. Flying rollers John Cinder and Silas Mooney, even Queen Mary herself. Isn't it true, Nichols demanded of her, that both you and Benjamin were part of the notorious Prince Michael's Mills colony in Detroit, both before and after the prince was sent to prison on morals charges nearly 35 years ago? Oh no, Queen Mary insisted. We were never part of that group. You are on a witness stand and you are under oath, the state's attorney reminded her. We may have stopped in for a few days just once on a preaching tour. There are still a number of members of that colony living who can be brought in as witnesses, George Nichols warned her. It's hard to remember that long ago. It may have been longer than just a few days. As a matter of fact, I think that was where the spirit first came to Benjamin. Isn't it true that he was a pillar of that colony? that he was one of the prince's closest advisors? Your Honor, Queen Mary turned to Judge Louis H. Fed. I refuse to testify against my husband. Your Honor, Nichols countered. Benjamin Purnell is not her husband and we can prove it. He turned back to Mary. When were you married to him? Where? The time and place of our marriage is a secret between Benjamin and myself. The prosecutor introduced documentary evidence showing her husband's marriage to Angelina had never been dissolved. Then he dropped the point and introduced records, supplied by Esther Johnson, of ten Israelites who had been secretly buried on High Island without any coroner ever issuing a death certificate. But these were merely preliminaries, warming up exercises for the long hard fight that lay ahead. On the third day, the prosecutor got down to the real business of the trial and set the pattern for the rest of the proceedings by calling a forum harem girl to the stand, Mrs. Ruth Swanson, the wife of the electrician who'd installed King Ben's raid warning system. How long did you live in the house of David? George Nichols asked her. About a year, she remembered. We sold our house in Florida and turned in all of the money, about $13,000. When was that? We came in 1913 and left in 1914. Were you and your husband allowed to go on living together at the colony? No, he lived out at the big farm with a bunch of other men. I was working in the office at Shiloh and I had a room right behind it on the first floor. Did you ever go upstairs? Yes. When was that? In the early fall of 1913. It was right after the big federal white slavery investigation. All of the girls from the second floor had been taken up to High Island and the place was almost deserted. 
Will you tell us what happened? Well, I always kept the door to my room locked because it was near the entrance to the street. Then one time, Myrtle Tuck came and knocked about midnight. She said the girls were coming back from High Highland, that my room was needed and I had to go upstairs. What did you say to that? I told her I'd be glad to share my room with other girls. She went away, then came back and said no. Benjamin said I had to go upstairs. Did you go then? Yes. And what happened? Well, I'd only been in bed upstairs a little while when the door opened and King Benjamin walked in. He sat down on the bed and talked for a long time. What did he talk about? About the Israelite faith, about how to attain immortality, about the importance of blood purification. Then what happened? Ruth Swanson hesitated for a long time, her face reddening. Well, I thought he was telling the truth, she finally said. She shook her head slowly. I actually thought that in submitting to him, I was doing the proper thing, what, what God wanted me to do. How did you happen to leave the colony? I finally got up enough nerve to tell my husband about it. He took me away right then and there. And was the money you'd brought with you when you joined returned when you left? No. We just got $10 in train tickets to Chicago. Thank you, Mrs. Swanson. George Nichols turned back to his seat. Your witness. William J. Barnard, the chief defense lawyer, bore down on the witness with an angry look on his face. He was an attorney every bit as famous as the great Colonel Atkinson had been a generation earlier, given to spectacular courtroom antics. The long-haired bearded Judge Dewurst was helping to mastermind the strategy from the defense counsel table. But on the floor, this was almost strictly Bill Barnard's show. Isn't it true, he loudly demanded of Mrs. Swanson, that upon leaving Benin Harbor, you and your husband both signed an affidavit releasing the house of David from any claim upon it? Yes, we had to. Oh, you had to. Isn't it also true, he shouted at her, that you signed other affidavits swearing that the house of David was a moral place? Yes. Yes. He waved his finger directly in her face. And so now, you come all the way back from Florida to tell an entirely different story. Why? Who contacted you and asked you to come? Well, Esther Johnson. Esther Johnson, huh? So Esther Johnson brought you in here with this story. How much money did she promise you? Just our expenses. She said the state would pay. Isn't it true? He shouted at the top of his lungs. That the only reason you're here telling this fantastic story is that if the house of David is abolished and his property sold, you're hoping for some of the proceeds? No, the woman sobbed. I'm here because I don't want what happened to me to happen to some other. No more questions. Barnard contemptuously turned his back on her and strode back to his seat. The prosecution then varied its attack by calling three men to the stand. Ruth Swanson's husband, who backed up her story, Hicks Vaughn, who told a typical tale of having his wife and daughter separated from him and his family destroyed after joining the colony, and Herbert Yogler, who testified about his forced marriage to Vaughn's daughter, Mildred. The defense accused all three of wanting the colony abolished to share in the proceeds. On May 19th, another girl who'd served in Ben Purnell's harem was called. The former Dolly Smith, now married, still an extremely attractive woman at 33. When were you first sent to live at Shiloh? Prosecutor Nichols asked her. In 1909, when I was 15. Will you tell us what happened? Well, Lily Berkman, a girl I'd been friends with, took me to King Benjamin's apartment. He fussed around with her for a while so I wouldn't be afraid. Then he took me on his lap and had Lily pull down the shades. Then she left. There was a long period of heavy silence. Were you forced to submit to him that night? George Nichols prompted her. Yes. And how long were you kept at Shiloh for immoral purposes? About three years. Then I was sent out on missionary duty. How many girls were in Benjamin Purnell's harem at this time? Around 30. Were there favorites among them? I think Toots Satsman was his favorite, although Harriet Boschke was quite a pet. 
but he kept Myrtle Tuck and May Cardi in the room next to him. On cross-examination, the now familiar accusation that this girl and the others were conspiring to have the House of David abolished and sharing its wealth was heard. If all this really happened, why is it that you waited nearly 20 years to tell anyone about it? Why didn't you go to the police long ago? What good would it have done? Dolly Smith yelled back. Hazel Ruth Wade went all the way to Washington and saw the president and what good did it do? King Benjamin had them all paid off, right on up to the top. On that note, Judge Fed adjourned the case until the following Thursday. As the army of newsmen scrambled to file their stories, several of them, seeking a new angle, caught the long-haired bearded Judge H.T. Dewhurst and interviewed him on the courthouse steps. Will King Ben appear to testify and answer these charges, they asked. Ben Purnell had been released on $10,000 bail. He most certainly will, providing his doctors permit it, of course. Is it true that he originally set the date of the millennium at 1906? A reporter asked. Of course not, Duharst laughed. I've seen a copy of one of his sacred writings, the reporter persisted, and that was the date given there. Oh yes, the bearded judge smiled. Benjamin has explained that to us. It was a printer's error. When court reconvened on May 26th, the state of Michigan called its star witness to the stand, the former Esther Johnson. And among the veteran trial reporters in the press section, it was the general opinion that the prosecution's case rested directly on her slim, narrow shoulders on how well she'd hold up under the hard-hitting cross-examination of the famed Bill Barnard. For years, Esther had campaigned against the House of David. It was she who'd gone about the country rounding up witnesses and urging them to come back to testify. It was she who supplied most of the evidence for the case. In the Attorney General's temporary office, set up in a downtown hotel room, she'd worked as tirelessly for the state of Michigan as she once worked for the Seventh Kingdom. And yet everything she'd done had merely led up to this moment. A hush hung over the courtroom as she walked up the aisle and took the oath. A trim little woman of 37 now, still pert and pretty. The rows of long-haired flying rollers stared curiously at her. In the years that had gone by since she left Benton Harbor, she'd become a legend among the Israelites, a dark, sinister menace waiting in the outside world. The newspapers had dubbed her King Ben's nemesis, but among the bearded cultists, she'd been painted as an evil demon, as the earthly representative of the Prince of Darkness. The Israelites, who'd never seen her before, were obviously shocked. She certainly looked harmless enough. The moment she began her testimony, the illusion vanished. Esther was far from harmless. Except when she told of her seduction aboard the Rising Sun, there was very little emotion in this woman's voice as she gave her answers, not even anger. Instead, calm and deadly and efficient, she dealt only in facts and figures. In running through her 18 years as an Israelite, she seemed to know exactly what aspects of King Ben's rule were criminal, and she stuck to the important points. His debauching of young girls, his taking money under false pretenses, his defrauding the government by faking dependency records for Israelite draftees, the cases of death and starvation that came from his rule, his blackmail, his forcing his subjects to commit perjury, even his falsifying property owner records to enable his subjects to vote against school taxes. Most damaging of all, she introduced office records and correspondence in Israelite pamphlets to document nearly everything she had to say. For three straight days, she piled up a mountain of evidence against Benjamin Franklin Purnell. And on the morning of her fourth day on the witness stand, as she waited for what should have been a feared and dreaded ordeal, the grueling, relentless cross-examination that superbly skilled Bill Barnard was sure to give her. A strange, out-of-place smile was on her face. It wasn't a smile of nervousness. It was a smile of eagerness and anticipation. An astounded whisper ran through the press section. That woman's actually enjoying this.